is it just like we each just do our spiel, or is it more like a... Yes, unless they're going to give me different. Okay. You'll give me the signal when we're live. Yeah, I think the concept is just I'll introduce person by person, and maybe people Go just give kind thing. of a 10-minute opening, yeah. and then we'll look at the time. Um, we were supposed to go to 5.30, we can go 5, 45, 6. Okay. So as long as we like to have a little time, I might post some questions you gotcha. know, based off of what different people have said for people to also keep responding. Perfect. Listen, don't throw anything. You're welcome to ask each other questions, post questions, and stuff like that, too. Perfect. Okay. We're live? And we're live. Well, good afternoon, almost good evening, everybody. Very happy to have you here for this panel here in the main hall at the People's Summit 2022, Pan-Africanism in Today's World. So please welcome ourselves to the space. You know, we have an amazing panel of, uh, amazing group of panelists with us here today. And I'll, I'll introduce people as we go along. And I know we're a little bit behind time and people have things to do, so you know, we'll try to be tight, but uh, I think the amount of information you can get from these folks is, is ultimately endless. And to me, this is a very timely panel and a very timely conversation to be having. Uh, obviously, I think the theme for those of us who have been here since the start yesterday around internationalism, Pan-Africanism by definition is an internationalist practice. So we know that, please. <laughs> And I think being here in the Americas, it's a unique conversation. I mean, obviously there are approximately, I believe, and, and, and James Early can correct me here if I'm wrong, approximately about 200 million Afro-descended people in the Americas. And obviously we know so much of that through the brutal legacy of slavery, but I think even connecting to today and our anti-imperialism, even still today we see the results of imperialism and the flows of migration they drive from the continent into the Americas, I think makes the Americas generally and here in the United States an interesting conversation about not only how we practice internationalism, but a unique cauldron for Pan-Africanism to grow, which has been true since the first Pan-African meetings in the early 1900s, but I think sometimes we think about it only in the past, and W.B. Du Bois and Kwame Nkrumah, which we need to think about and we need to reach to and we need to remember, but I think that kind of generative discussion and political activity is still with us today and still growing in different, different ways. I mean, you look at what's happening at the southern border, and even though our media, our media, I don't know why I call it that, uh, has whitewashed it, I mean, you have people from Haiti, from Cameroon, from Nigeria, all making up huge percentages of the flows of migration coming in through the southern border. And you know, what does that look like? What does that mean? What are the consequences? What are the possibilities? I think that's some of what we're gonna be able to talk about here today. And I personally am very excited to have that conversation and to be able to embed the struggle of Afro-descended people into the conversation about how you struggle against imperialism in the Americas and around the world. And I think it can be a platform really for lifting up the struggle against imperialism around the world by linking together many different continents, many different struggles, uh, and many different peoples. So I'm really excited to be here. I hope you're really excited to be here. I think our panelists are excited to be here. Someone said, yeah, they were excited to be here. Are y'all excited to be here? Okay, I had to make sure. It's 4.45. We're live. We cannot be quiet. We got to get the energy flowing. We got to be ready to go, uh, and we got to make it happen. So I don't want to editorialize and say too much here. Uh, well, maybe I do, but I'm not going to <laughs> because they've made me the moderator of the event. But what we want to do is we want to go down the panel, have our panelists make some opening remarks, uh, you know, just sort of where they're sitting starting this conversation. Then I think we'll maybe pose some questions, me to them, them to each other, and we'll just try to have a conversation here. But thanks everyone for being here, and I'm, I'm really excited to get started. So we're going to start to my immediate left with, you know, one of my good comrades here, Kambale Musavuli, who is originally from the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. But I also want to say he was on the front line of the struggle in Ferguson as well, which is critically important. He's based out of Ghana currently, so really, I think, embodying the spirit of this panel. But I have to give people their, their, their correct propers here, and I really want to do read his, his, his bio. He's a native, as I mentioned, of the Democratic Republic of Congo, a leading human rights advocate and analyst with the Center for Research on the Congo and Shasha, and for over a decade he has served as a spokesperson for the Friends of the Congo, 
and Kambale lectures on conflict minerals, peace and security, advocacy, grassroots mobilizing, social movements, the role of youth in Africa, corporate social responsibility, gender-based violence, and its connection to resource exploitation and poverty. So in case you didn't know, he knows a lot about a lot of things. <laughs> and he firmly believes that Pan-Africanism based on, he firmly believes that through Pan-Africanism based on scientific socialism, Congolese and Africans have a chance to regain control of their land and their destiny. Welcome to Mbale. They told you and me, we came from the Congo. Isn't that what they told you? I mean, isn't that what they taught us in school? So we came from the Congo. We are savages and cannibals and all that kind of stuff from the Congo. They've been teaching uh, me all of my life I'm from the Congo. I love the Congo. That's my country. And that's my people. That's my people that your airplanes are killing over there. That's Malcolm X in Harlem, mm. no, December 13, 1964. I used that sentence to kind of bring us to understand Pan-Africanism beyond just the rhetoric. Why a young man in Harlem felt that what's happening in Mississippi and Alabama is connected to also what's happening in the Congo. And lift up the concept of Pan-Africanism, not just a, a location, right? Because you have five or six offices in main offices in, in, uh, on the African continent, say you're in uh, Lagos, you're in Johannesburg, you're in Nairobi, now you become a Pan-African bank. Yes, there is a bank that has the audacity to call itself a Pan-African bank. And that's actually EcoBank. But that's not the Pan-Africanism we're talking about. We're not talking about the Pan-Africanism of the banks. We're talking about the revolutionary Pan-Africanism of the people. And we center this Pan-Africanism of the people with the declaration of the fifth Pan-African Congress that took place in Manchester in 1945. After two world wars, young Africans from the Americas, from the Caribbeans, some in Europe met right at the end of World War II to say, wait a minute, we bleed red like them, how come we colonize? Wait a minute, how come we don't control the resources on our land? And as they sat down, they were clear about what they needed to fight. A world free of exploitation, a world free of colonialism, and free of racism. And they were clear about what they wanted to fight for. In the declaration of that Congress, they say, we are determined to be free. So the freedom is not just for us Africans, it's for the world. So our fight for Pan-Africanism will liberate the world of oppression. Beyond that, they said, we condemn monopoly of capital and rule of private wealth and industry for private profit alone. So these young folks are, say, are now saying, let's go to Africa and wear some Kente cloth. What they're saying is, we don't control our land. We don't control our resources. We want to make sure that we control it so that not a minority of the local bourgeoisie of Africa, yes, we have that class also on the continent that look like me, who are still exploiting us, so if we have clear class analysis, we understand why Africans actually fought for uh, independence. So they were very clear, and that's where we ground our Pan-Africanism. A Pan-Africanism based on scientific socialism simply means we do not want to use the options of the West of capital. So as Africans, when we look at what they've done, we say, oh, New York looks beautiful. Paris looks beautiful. Let's make sure Accra looks like New York. How did they achieve that development? 400 years of free labor. That's how they accumulated the capital. Is this what we on the African continent have to do? No. One, that option is not available to us. And two, it's inhumane. Where will Africans catch slaves to accumulate for 400 years capital to build a city like New York City? We can't do that. So those who fought for independence, those who participated in Manchester were clear. 
if we want to unite the oppressed of the world, those who have be, been subjected, uh, subjugated to slavery, those who have become landless, those who were treated uh, as less than humans, yet still send them to fight their wars. What we must do is, as we unite, that unity means nothing if our bauxite still belongs to the uh, United Kingdom, if our gold is controlled by the Belgians, if our diamonds is controlled by the French. So we, what we have to do before we unite, we must take control of our land, we must take control of our resources, we must exploit these resources, take the profit from that exploitation, and do what with it? Build roads, hospitals, schools, and things that will change the conditions of our people. They call it socialism. So, that process of young Africans coming together in 1945 had a concrete and tangible proof that it works. They met in 1945 without TikTok, without Twitter, without Facebook. Within 15 years, at least a dozen of African nations became independent because of what they say in that meeting, right? It was for 15th of October to 21st of October, 1945. So think about a week-long meeting created a movement where young Africans were able to become independent. It continues. So when people tell you about Pan-Africanism, does it work? Did it work? Of course. The independence of my own country, the Congo, could not be achieved if it wasn't for Pan-Africanism. All you know is Patrice Lumumba. But you don't know that Serge Michel, the Algerian, was an advisor to Patrice Lumumba. You don't know that André Bloin, a woman from Central African Republic, actually wrote the Independence Day speech. So when you're talking about Patrice Lumumba that says, Combattant de l'indépendance aujourd'hui victorieux, je vous salue. Fighters for independence today victorious, I salute you. A woman wrote that speech. Mm, Beyond that, you had the Mau Mau also <laughs> in the Congo organizing for independence. So you had a Pan-African force, right, that did not identify by national identity. They knew the importance of the Congo from the 1958 All-African People's Conference saying, we must make sure this young man and his, the movement around him are able to succeed, and they achieved it, and many other nations have succeeded. So let's move quickly here because the time is short, 10 minutes is not long enough. Uh, to discuss everything. I hope we'll be able to exchange, but th the question is, is Pan-Africanism today existent? How does it express itself? Right? So, we may use examples of the African Union. I'm talking about a revolutionary practice of Pan-Africanism. When, Pan uh, when Kwame Krumah thought about Pan-Africanism, it was clear that we needed a continental um, entity or a governmental entity that will make sure that countries can collaborate through different things, economic, trades, uh, military forces, and so on. But what it made sure to say, while you may have a continental framework, you also need to have a people's movement, an all-African people's movement. And that movement, right, has to be vibrant to challenge who? The elites. That sometimes whenever we are discussing Africa, we forget the class an analysis that we also have an elite sometimes, or most of the time, have no interest of the working people of the African continent. So if you don't have a force of the people challenging that institution, this is why you're going to have some AU members forgetting that Palestine, we always must support it, and Israel cannot be a member state of the African Union. So while you clap, you should know that right now a big discussion of the African Union is to have Israel as a member state of the African Union. So I'm hearing you clap. I want you to really understand what is happening on the African continent for the lack of social movement, uh, strengthening of the social movements to be able to challenge the status quo. 
But Pan-Africanism is a process today no, that is tried and tested from east to west when you see young Nigerians mobilizing right, against police brutality and their understanding that what is happening in Nigeria is also happening in other countries, other places on the African continent. That's an expression of people's Pan-Africanism that I want to see. And I, I see a lot of that happening. When I'm seeing young people in Gabon, a country of 1.2 million people, understanding that they protest for representation is connected to youth in Uganda who are doing the work to work protest, saying we're not going to take buses to stop an imposed dictator on them. Yuri Museveni was been in power since 1986, backed by the United States. When we look at the regional embodiment of uh, look at ECOWAS, the regional bodies in uh, West Africa, where people in West Africa are able at least to move free. You don't need a visa to move from Mali to Ghana, Ghana to Niger, Niger to Burkina Faso because of the regional block. It's an expression that in concepts, people are understanding. But what they must fight, the struggle of today for Pan-Africanism beyond uh, these uh, small anecdotes that I may share, is the increased militarization of the African continent. It's not just the United States that's on the African continent. There are many uh, military bases on the African continent, but the U.S. has the most military bases. They are moving the so-called war on terror, where Africans have lived peacefully for thousands of years, and now all of a sudden they're telling us that we are jihadists. And one wonders how they're getting this sophisticated weapon right after the fall of Gaddafi. Mm. Right? So the increased militarization of, African, of the African continent is one of the struggles that the people are waging. The second one is uh, the proper representation of the people. Right? Their government do not reflect what the will of the people is. So you hear the stories of the di these dictators. The, these dictators, um, it's not a dictatorship that I support. I love the one from the proletariat. Mm. But this one is from these uh, elites, right? These elites who are in power are supported and backed by our taxpayers' money here in the United States. I gave an example, Yoram Museveni. I'm sure some of you have heard of uh, refugees in the UK being flown into Rwanda uh, today. Those two nations are U.S. allies on the so-called war on terror, and they get all the support. The fourth one is the work, the labor, right? Most Africans are not able to sustain themselves because of what people would call unemployment, but it's really creating uh, the disunity of the classes, making sure that some can work, a very small minority, while the vast majority of the population uh, is not working. And the last one is the extreme resource exploitation. So the, all these struggles... How will Pan-Africanism help us? We on the African continent and those in the diaspora must look at Africa from a class perspective, but specifically to revitalize the call of a new independence movement for the African continent. We achieved a political independence in 1960. They did not let us control our wealth. So if we want to be free, not just for the African continent, not just for the African diaspora, but for the world, yeah. Africans must unite to demand that the people of the continent control their land, control their resources, so that Elon Musk is not taking Congo's cobalt to put in his Tesla vehicle and send people to space, and then people wonder how he can have $5 billion to buy a company. He did not just create that money. That wealth came from somewhere, right? Historical... Uh, capital made it possible for him, but where did he get that wealth from? From the concrete um, material of the Congo's resources, right? I think I will land, and I hope during the Q&A I may add additional element. I do believe Pan-Africanism today is existent. Mm -hmm. I lived it. I lived it as uh, I had, I don't know if I should say a blessing, to be a refugee. Uh, in a country that's actually caused the conflict in my country, that, that has taken the lives of six million Congolese. But the experience I had here took me to North Carolina A&T State University. Okay, and I give pride. Any Aggies in the room? All right. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so I went to North Carolina A&T at HBCU in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I was pleasantly surprised that the student at the campus 
When I told them about the story of the Congo, you know what they told me? Hey, Kambale, how can, I, can we help you? In 2008, North Carolina a and students helped us create a global movement called Congo Week. So no one can tell me people don't care about the African continent. Mm. That's why I even started with the quote of Malcolm X. What well, made that young man speak about the Congo in 1964, uh, uh, 63, is the same reason why in 2008, students at North Carolina a and saw what was happening in the Congo, could understand that this is also happening in Greensboro, North Carolina, and lend their voice to support the Congolese people. So this is really our call for today. I think I will end with the last one. Uh, let us be sure never to forget it, that the fate of us all is at stake in the Congo. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kambale. Uh, and I think you can see why it's such an honor for many of us here to be able to struggle alongside Kambale. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't connect a couple dots. I'm glad you mentioned the, the points of militarization because, you know, sometimes you look at things very much in silos. But if you look at what's happening with the war in Ukraine right now, you know, the head of the European Commission is Ursula von der Leyen. She used to be the Minister of Defense of Germany. And when she was the Defense Minister of Germany, her biggest priority was to increase the role of European troops on the African continent. So when you look at Germany right now, now adding 100 billion euros to its defense budget and saying that they're going to rapidly remilitarize and you wonder what's going on there, have no doubt that many of those troops and many of those weapons and many of those bombs are going to be used on the African continent to oppress African people. So it might seem unrelated, but I can pretty much guarantee you it's 100% related uh, and it speaks to the global nature of our struggle. But once again, thank you, Kambale Musawuli. I want, to, I want to turn next to someone who I really only met about a year and a half ago, but I have to say I've been very, very privileged to struggle alongside in that year and a half, Hermela Aragawi. Hermela is a Los Angeles-based Ethiopian-American journalist and community organizer. She's a co-founder of the No More movement at No More Global, and No More, for those of you who don't know, is a global grassroots pro-Africa and pan-African movement that originated in Africa, and Hermela previously to becoming a fantastic activist, did work in the media. She's a real journalist. Uh, you know, I'm just pretending to be a journalist following your footsteps. But you worked for many different places, but left in 2021 to really work full time and to struggle full time on, on the issues around the African continent. So Hermela, please take it away. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's really hard to follow Kambale, but I'll do my best. <laughs> So as Eugene said, uh, I like to call myself a recovering mainstream media journalist. I most, <laughs> re <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I most recently worked for a CBS 2 KKL9 here in Los Angeles for the last few years and I left because I was so frustrated with the way that we call mainstream media, which I think more accurately is called government media here in the United States. If we're to be really accurate about it, I was really frustrated with the way the conflict in Ethiopia, which started in November 2020, was being covered. It was completely getting flipped on its head. It was essentially a democratically elected government that was fighting an ethno-fascist armed insurgency group. Uh, so ethno-fascist meaning they thought their ethnicity needed to rule Ethiopia for 100 years and dominate the entire region. They did do that for 27 years between uh, 91 and uh, 2018, but we're sidelined by six years of the struggle of the people uh, and were voted out properly through parliament. Uh, but 27 years wasn't enough, and so they had to attack National Army Defense Forces in November 2020 and start a war against Ethiopia, its people, as well as Eritrea, its neighbors. If you look at the mainstream media narrative on this story, they would tell you this ethno-fascist group is the victim of a genocide, and the Ethiopian people and the government and the Eritrean people and the government are the ones that are responsible for trying to commit this genocide. It's extremely frustrating. Um, and so, you know, we're, we were trying to reach out to CNN and New York Times and all these places that have had way more credibility than they have actually earned, that continued to fail up 
uh, while destroying much of the world through false narratives. Uh, but they weren't really trying to hear the voice of the people, right? They had an agenda. They were doing the State Department's bidding, uh, the TPLF, which is this ethno-fascist group in Ethiopia, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, was the proxy for the U.S. Uh, the U.S., through its uh, different uh, mainstream media outlets, um, uh, through the State Department, was essentially supporting their narrative, um, saying, you know, the response of the Ethiopian government, the Eritrean government, is a genocide of people of our ethnicity as opposed to this political group. So that's how I jumped off that ship and went independent. Um, and it's been extremely fulfilling, honestly, in so many ways. It feels like it has a lot more impact than uh, the work that I was doing uh, here with uh, CVS. So moving into our conversation or our topic um, of Pan-Africanism, the traditional kind of standard definition is a sense of uh, movement that, sense, that creates a sense of brotherhood and collaboration among all people of African descent, whether they uh, live inside the continent or outside of Africa. But since we're talking about Pan-Africanism Pan in today's world, I would argue it's much bigger than that at this point, right? First of all, Africans, you know, myself and Kambale, who were from the continent, have to come to some sort of agreement about how their struggles are connected. For so long, and I would say we're still struggling with this, Africans themselves are getting this, their stories wrong about each other, right? Because they're listening to much of their stories and their neighbor stories through these mainstream media outlets, through so-called international human rights organizations like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, which is just an arm of the colonial projects. They come in and they pretend like they're the ones who care more about you than your neighbor does, but what they're trying to do is create rifts. It's essentially, uh, it's, it's as if a stranger invades your home and they don't let you talk to your brother or sister without them mediating. So of course you're not going to get the true story of each other in that way, right? So um, it's, it's been really a work in progress, even what's going on, what went on in Rwanda in terms of what they you know, called the genocide that had a focus only on the Tutsis and didn't really talk about the role of Paul Kagame and the, uh, the suffering of the Hutus. Ethiopians themselves and Eritreans are learning now, oh, wait a minute, we've gotten the story of Rwanda wrong. There's a whole sect of people that are being left out in that story. And Paul Kagame, who is being celebrated on the world stage, has blood on his hands, right? Often when you look at uh, leaders on the African continent and elsewhere in the global south being celebrated by the West, you can bet they're glorified terrorists. Mm, come on. Right? <laughs> And alternatively, when you see a leader being demonized on the African continent as being a genocider and a dictator, you can bet what he's trying to do is resist the greed, the demonic greed of imperialism, a kind of greed that just can't get enough. Right, So that's one thing that I would uh, encourage anyone who might not be as familiar with the stories out of Africa, uh, just to really look at the sort of ways, uh, the tools that they use to make you turn against leaders that are actually for the people. So the first part of Pan-Africanism today is Africans making sure they connect. We need a Pan-African, uh, as much Pan-African media as possible. Kambale is a part of one, but we need more um, covering all the different languages that are spoken on the continent or that the, have the majority of... Uh, uh, speakers on the African continent. And then the second part of today's Pan-Africanism is Africans on the continent connecting with African Americans here, right? And uh, uh, Malcolm X was sort of one of the leaders of that way ahead of his time, even before we had and the internet and social media to be able to connect the dots. Um, uh, when I first moved to this country from Ethiopia in, in 1994 in Mississippi, African Americans and Africans had such stereotypical stories about each other, right? So the people who are native to Mississippi would say all kinds of things to me about what, Afri what they thought being Africa meant. We were coming out of the 80s famine in Ethiopia, which the West very much had a lot to do with, um, as, as we've all come to learn. Uh, so they saw us as being just inherently poor and coming out of a war. And then the other side of that too is African immigrants because of the media that is shared, the Western media that's shared in Ethiopia had this stereotypical view of African Americans as being either 
doctors and lawyers like the Cosbys, because which ran there, or being uh, criminals, because cops ran there too, right? So we came here, we come here uh, to meet people who have a lot more in common than not, and we both have this really uh, warped view of each other. So Africans and African Americans, I'd say, you know, new African Americans and uh, uh, native African Americans have to have that understanding. That's the second part of Pan-Africanism. I mean, there's no sense in fighting for Black Lives Matter here, but then when you look at the story out of Ethiopia, you're on the side of armed insurgents because you're reading CNN, right? Thank you. That, to me, is one of the most frustrating things about good, ordinary people that believe they're on the side of social justice, and they get it right on one hand, and they're literally on the side of the oppressor on the other. And I have empathy for it, because mainstream media does a really good job of making it seem like they're really on the side of the, you know, the, the oppressed, uh, but I think we're all smart enough to be able to start to dissect it in this day and age where you've got places like Breakthrough News that you can rely on. <laughs> Shout out to Breakthrough News. Truly, I mean, it's, it's one of the places that I suggest Black Agenda Reports, uh, 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 w well done. <laughs> and uh, Gray Zone does a pretty good job, too. I know they cover a lot of Latin America, but they also do cover um, uh, Africa. So that's, uh, you know, more media, the better. The more independent media, the better. I do genuinely still believe in journalism. When it's done right, it can literally change the world and rift divides. Uh, but we need to have more outlets that are doing it right, as opposed to all of these... Um, just kind of false organizations. The third part of today's Pan-Africanism is connecting all exploited people to each other, right? And recognizing that our struggles are connected and what's going on in Ethiopia, what's going on in Latin America. We've got the Summit of the Americas happening right now. If we had the Summit of Africa, the same formula would be used. They would use these sort of, you know, ethno-fascist, greedy, elite, people coming out of Ethiopia saying they represent Ethiopia when they represent maybe a sliver, maybe 2% of the population, and they would call it some of the Africas. They would take people from Rwanda and the DRC that represent the elite, that pre represent the uh, group of people that are oppressing, and they would say we're having some of the Africas, right? So it's really some of the same tools that are used, the same tools of exploitation, and story is a big part of it, uh, actual military presence that Eugene referred to as well as Kambali referred to, we have U.S. military uh, in the Horn of Africa as well as in most African countries. The only one I know of for sure that doesn't have it is Eritrea, which is a small uh, African country north of Ethiopia you rarely hear about. I would argue they're the Cuba of Africa. They have resisted imperialism for nearly 30 years. And because of that, the West hates them. Right, They are a bad example of what can happen when the people are united, when they understand the game that's played between them. And so they're not shaky about, uh, they don't shake depending on what story comes out of the outlets or what story comes out of Amnesty or Human Rights Watch. They're very, very clear. Or, or the UN, for that matter, aid agencies have played a huge role in fueling the conflict in Ethiopia. They keep talking about uh, you know, wanting to give aid to this terrorist group's region, um, but there's suspicions that through that aid, there are weapons that are going in, right? And, and something we know are confirmed to be true is UN trucks, UN humanitarian aid trucks, are actually being used by this armed insurgent group to go through different borders and kill civilians. This is the United Nations, right? It's, it's the, that understanding of the role of aid agencies and these so-called international human rights bodies like um, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, I think is really important um, to not get fooled in terms of the stories coming out of the continent. A third of the African continent is under economic sanctions. It's not just poor on accident, right? It's poor because the West is making a concerted effort to sideline it from the international economy to keep countries that are resisting its imperialist efforts from getting the international loans that everybody else can get, to be able to trade in the same way that everybody else can trade, to uh, block these countries from getting basic goods that are actually leading to civilians dying needlessly. Um, so in, I would say in even the most conscious of rooms that there's some people that has, still have the stereotypical idea of Africa as if Africa it actually just kind of 
you know, e even Africans will say that about Africa sometimes. They'll say, oh, it's Africa. No, it's not just Africa. It was, it's Africa because it's designed to be this way. The U.S. will just not let go. Right? We are having to resist as a people. We had to come up with the hashtag no more movement a year into the conflict because there was no mainstream way to get the uh, voice of the people in there. And hundreds of thousands of people are dying in this war while the U.S. Uh, defends armed insurgents. Um, and so I think the, the power of the people is something to me as a sort of new organizer and new activist um, is... is is becoming so abundantly clear. There are US government officials that have asked us to change the hashtag no more. Why? Because they realize it is cognizant of the fact that our struggles are connected beyond Ethiopia, beyond the Horn of Africa, beyond Eritrea or Somalia, beyond Africa as a whole, but all over the global south. That kind of recognition is their worst nightmare because they love to, to have struggles that are more focused on ethnicity or nationality uh, or region as opposed to the people, the people, the ordinary people, uh, the poor people or those that care about poor people actually coming together and saying no more to the tools of exploitations which start with false stories that then divide people that should otherwise be working together and that make war and conflict possible. And so I think I'm uh, running out of time a little bit, but uh, with, you know, we have no more dot global as a website. So I encourage all of you guys to check that out. In November, we went out with 30 cities across the world, rallied millions of people, including in the capital of Ethiopia, saying no more. We see the bullshit. Just stop. We're going to stay united. Um, we're no longer fooled by this, uh, you know, human rights angle that they continue to take while our or, uh, while, while our people are dying in masses. In Mali, they kicked out the French troops. Why? Because they asked for it. They brought them in to help them fight the extremism that had come out of the Gaddafi assassination and that was bleeding into Mali. And 10 years later, what did they figure out? This thing is getting worse. We've got French troops that are here, you know, high level elite French troops that have been here for 10 years and somehow the extremism is getting worse. The violence is getting worse. So they said, get out. You know, no more of this, right? So <laughs> African countries are waking up. We're not so stupid after all. Um, and there's so much more to come. And I think spaces like this really honestly just like fill my heart because I realize there's so many of us that are more aware about what's going on in the world and there's just no stopping this, you know? And it's just a matter of time before we see a different kind of world. Right Thank on. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But there's so many things I can say. Let me not say too much. And so much. I just always appreciate you and, and you know a lot of the work that you've done that made it possible for me to do a lot of the work we've done at Breakthrough News covering the Horn of Africa. So I really appreciate that. And I'm very glad you brought up Black Agenda Report because I did want to mention Jamima Pierre, who is an editor of Black Agenda Report, was not able to make it here today. But I still want to shout her out, not just because the work of Black Agenda Report, but all the work that she does, which is fantastic. <laughs> Especially on her home country of Haiti, I, I, to me, we, you know, we interview her a lot at Breakthrough News, there's no one better to talk to about what's going on in the ground in Haiti. So Jamima Pierre, even though she's not here in person, I encourage you, you know, look at her name in the program book, search her name. If you have a media outlet, interview her. Uh, critically important to understand everything that's continuing to go on in Haiti. Who, you don't hear about it as much in America. People in Haiti are struggling very hard right now. They're blacked out in the American media. You know, the, the so-called language barrier makes it very difficult. You've got a fake imposed leader in Haiti right now, so-called Prime Minister Dr. Ariel Henry. How did he become the Prime Minister? Well, he apparently assassinated the last president. I, I, I don't know. The assassins called him twice on the night of the assassination. I don't know what that means. Um, he then got six, I think it was six, maybe 12 random senators to vote him in as the prime minister. And the United States, this is according to the New York Times, not Eugene Perrier, the United States called the guy who had taken over before him and were like, you just got to give the power to Ariel Henry. And believe it or not, he was one of the key figures in the coup against Aristide in 2004, also engineered by the United States to destroy the sovereignty of the Haitian people, who anytime they rise up and take control of their country, 
believe it or not, the United States always seems to find a way to be there um, to crush them, crush them down. So I hope we can continue to follow Haiti, continue to look at Haiti. And, and I'll just add this little caveat. Haiti is one of the most pan-African places I've ever been in my life. I mean, just the, the sense of history and the sense of, of, of the place that Haiti has, I think in the hearts of so many African people because of the revolution uh, that took place there, that defeated the French, that defeated the slave owners, uh, is, is deeply palpable. I remember we were just driving down the road in Port-au-Prince and we turned the corner and like, boom, there was a giant mural of George, uh, related to the George Floyd uh, uprising and it was <laughs> I wish it's hard to describe in a way it's one of the most amazing murals I've ever seen but point being uh, at the end of the mural was what's the name of the cop uh, someone give it George, Derek Chauvin uh, it was Derek Chauvin being choked out by a black woman from Haiti uh, and I thought that was a powerful statement I'll also note that Haiti is the only country on earth that has a street named after John Brown, which I think is interesting. And you can turn off a of John Brown Avenue on the Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue in Port-au-Prince, which we did in a mass march. So uh, deep and, and powerful, powerful uh, history, culture, and struggle there that I think is unfortunately not well enough known um, here in the United States. So shout out to Jamima Pierre. I'm sorry she couldn't be with us, but please check out her work. <laughs> Absolutely. Indeed. Uh, I want to next bring up a new comrade of mine. This is the first time we've interacted. I hope it won't be the last. And that's Channing Martinez, who is, well, based here in L.A. Please, please. I know you all know. And Channing is the director of organizing and labor community director of organizing at the Labor Community Strategy Center, co-chair of the Bus Riders Union, producer of Voices from the Front Line on KPFK, a graduate of Audubon Middle School, Crenshaw High School, and Otis College of Art and Design, and is also the Strategy Center's national on the national the Strategy Center's National Leadership School for Strategic Organizing. He's a member of the faculty there and plays a significant role representing the Strategy Center in the Police Free LA USD Coalition. I'm all for that which defunded the L.A. school police budget by $25 million so far as they move to full defunding. I just got hyped reading your introduction. <laughs> Shannon, take it away. Uh, well, testing, testing. Can you guys hear me? So thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, the first thing I want to start with is thanking... Uh, Sabina for adding me and adding the bus riders union to this panel. Uh, I want to thank Cameron Hurt, who I met at Strategy and So, and said we had to connect. And then all of a sudden, he was introducing me to a lot of folks, and now we're on this panel, right? Right. Um, you know, I'll start with this. Um, I'm an organizer, and many of you guys are organizers and activists. And if you know any organizers, we always ask you to do something. So we're gonna ask you to do something. And I'll get you know, straight to the point is one thing we want you to do is to come by, this booth, come by our booth and buy this book, Playbook for Progressives, 16 Qualities of the Successful Organizer. And with everything I'm talking about, this is sort of the frame of our organizing model of everything that we use that is rooted in pan-Africanism, anti-imperialism, pro-communism, pro-socialism, um, <laughs> anti-patriarchy, um, and building a base to take on the system, right? Um, and even this quote here, I'll read this quote here on the front, an art of war for organizers around the world, buy 10 copies and pass it on, and that's a quote by Mike Davis, you heard what he said, mm. buy 10 copies and pass it on. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wanted to be on this panel, and I wanted to have this panel here at the conference because, you know, back in 1990, the Strategy Center went to the World Conference Against Racism. And there's an incident that Eric tells me about that a diplomat had a hot mic on, and he snuck and said, what are we going to do about the United States? And everybody in the conference heard it. Um, and everyone knew that that was the elephant in the room. And I wanted to bring that question into this conference today to talk about what are we going to do about the United States, right? Behind all of what's going on in Africa, 
behind all of the underdevelopment and neocolonialism going here on here in the United States, right? That, that is the question of the day. Um, and so we have a organizing uh, office, we have a theater, we have a bookstore, we have the Strategy and Soul Movement Center in the heart of Black South Central. Um, you know, I think you know that South Central, like many of the city centers around the country and like many of the country, uh, many African nations, is totally being, you know, depleted of the black community, right? Um, we just had an event in February where we were launching the National Leadership School for Strategic Organizing. And we spent months reading Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And one thing I learned by doing that, and one thing I keep saying, which I really am excited about, even months later, is that I got to read the first chapter of that book while I was on vacation visiting my family in Belize. And God, you think that it's bad here in the United States. You read where Walter Rodney is saying, these are the elements of what underdevelopment looks like. And I look down from the book, oh, there goes the neo-colonialist -colonial leader right here in St. Byte. Oh, here goes the United States actually giving aid to all these countries and against, the, uh, against Belize, right? So it's plain in my face. Um, and being able to see that made me think about the neocolonialism here in the United States and how everyone, just about everyone in the United States loves everything the United States is doing internationally, right? So we go here, we, go, we actually get on the buses, um, we go talking to bus riders, right? And in our conversations, we hear a lot of the internalized things that they've learned, right? A lot of people love Obama, for example, even though Obama killed Gaddafi, right? right. Um, we're doing a lot of work around culture, right? And one thing that you know, I always reference is that terrible film, Marvel film, Black Panther, where they have two nations, black nations fighting against each other and the CIA the coming CIA, together right, right. and saving the fucking day. What the fuck is that, right? Um, and I get that it's a, it's a, what do you call it, a fictional film or whatever this shit is, but, um, right. But even more than that, right, if you take the whole situation of Gaddafi, that is the situation of Gaddafi, right? Mm. Gaddafi was building a real revolutionary socialist nation, and the president of the United States, a black man, mm. President Obama, killed it. Right. And people, black folks loved the fucking shit out of Obama, even though at the same time he was elected, that was happening, right? <clears throat> people were being driven out of New Orleans. Mm. The bus system was being cut here in Los Angeles. Right. Increasing and in increasing of the funding of police, right? And the question that it really brought on me to, this is the study of Walter Rodney, is how do we actually create a force here in Los Angeles to actually take on the Democratic Party? I think beyond anything, beyond anything, that has been the real struggle for us. So. You know, I, I think I've said a lot about what we do. I think the question is that we need your help, right? We've been taking on the Metro, which is the way that we come into the conversation around imperialism and neocolonialism. We've been taking on them on for 25 years, right? We won a big lawsuit, that, which I know a lot of folks have heard about, about the bus rising union winning $2.5 billion of improvements and moving towards the cleanest uh, fleet possible, but the moment the court actually let up, um, what is it called, trusteeship of the metro, they flipped everything, right? They cut two million hours of service. They've raised affairs by 100%. Black folks have been 50% of the tickets and arrests on metro buses and trains every single year for the last 15 years. And I'm sure it's not a surprise to you, but we have a really large movement population here in Los Angeles but not one of those forces are trying to really come behind the bus rising and figure out how do you take on the Democratic Party, right? I'm a little bit tired, to be quite frank, of us talking about what Pan-Africanism is and talking about all these theories of Pan-Africanism, 
But how do we then take those theories and take them into the streets, right? And really build a real movement of folks that want to not just take on the buses, but take on President Obama, take on uh, President Biden, right? And actually do real solidarity work with the nations of Africa, right? Um, Um, so here's, here's what I'll go. Um, the thing we need help on is we've been in this struggle for 10 years, and, and it really has been a struggle, right? We haven't won any major victories on the side of the buses in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years, right? Um, we need your help to do everything in your power to fight the Democratic Party. That can look like coming out to strategy in Seoul and doing field trips there to learn about our revolutionary bookstore. We have the 40 most important books to, I'm um, sorry, the 50 most important books to read in a lifetime to become a successful organizer. Everything from Playbook for Progressive, we, I just some got, was gifted the Red New Deal, so we're gonna have this in our library today. Um, Walter Rodney's How Under, uh, Europe Underdeveloped Africa, um, Kwame Nkrumah's books. We have uh, a new book on, um, uh, God, I've been saying her name all day, now I can't remember it. Uh, Claudia uh, Jones, thank you. Um, and next to that, we have a theater, right? Um, we have been in the midst of COVID convening a Strategy and Soul Thursday Night Revolutionary Organizers Film and Book Club, and we've been coming together and watching really revolutionary films. We opened the film club with watching uh, The Battle of Algiers, which I think is one of the greatest films on revolution that has ever been made. Um, we watched uh, The Spook Who Sat By The Door. We watched uh, so many, so many very, really revolutionary books, but it was a nice experiment, right? We got you know, a good 50 to 75 people on Zoom every time we did it, like once, uh, once a month. But we're still having trouble of figuring out how do we then take those folks to make the struggle real in person. And so one thing you can do is sign up with the Strategy Center and become a member of the Film and Book Club to help us both facilitate that Film and Book Club and then take those ideas out into the streets. Um, the second thing is that, as you mentioned, we have defunded the school police by 25 million. All right. um, yeah. That was that was at the height of COVID and at the height of the struggle around George Floyd. And the way we always say it is, we've been fighting in the schools and buses. Excuse me. I'm sorry. We've been fighting in the schools and on the buses for 20 years. We've been essentially reforming the police in the LA schools for years, right? We got rid of truancy tickets. They gave students $250 truancy tickets. We got rid of military grade weapons. The LAUSD was part of the Department of Defense and got a MRAP tank. They had 61 M16 assault rifles. They had three grenade launchers. Um, one popular story that everyone knows that you know, the system always makes mistakes and is saying stupid things. But one thing they said to us, for example, is they would not use the grenade launchers to shoot grenades at the students. They would shoot tear gas at the students during fights, right? Um, so that was an 18-month struggle, and we got rid of those uh, weapons. But our students have always wanted to figure out how do you then get rid of the police? And so now that we're in 2022 and there is no George Floyd, it's a complicated struggle, right? All of the elected officials, even some of the most progressives like Monica Garcia were very excited in 2020 to figure out, I wanna do something. Um, we've been working with Monica from the day she was elected and she's been one of the most progressive board members on the board, right? And she's helped us to do everything. She was the first person uh, to actually write a letter um, of apology for having military grade weapons. But today there's, I don't know how to describe it. I, I, there's a delay and there's a hesitancy to figure out then how do you move towards a full defund? 
because everyone knows that once you defund them, everyone's going to be put under pressure to figure out what are you going to do about your police force in your city? What is the LAPD going to do about the police force spending 50% of the fucking budget on police when you're not even feeding the houseless population 50% of who are black, right? Um, so we need your help in joining that campaign to call on elected officials to vote the right way and stand on the right side of history. Um, the last thing I'll say um, is in our struggle to organize around the Democratic Party, uh, we've been talking about how do we organize on the same level as them. And to be frank, we've been talking about someone should run against them and there was plans, maybe, maybe someone should be mayor. I mean, maybe we should run Eric Mann or Manuel Criollo as the mayor against uh, Mayor Garcetti at that point. Um, but in 2019, uh, opened up a really great possibility where two seats were being opened. Um, Mark Gurley Thomas was ending his term and Herb Wesson was ending his term and they planned to switch seats and run for each other's seats, as the system always does, to keep the system going in its same oppressive things. So we decided that I should run for the city council. And it's the first time I was on a panel just like this, on the side of Mark Ridley Thomas, as opposed to being down you know, in the dungeon looking up at them, right? Um, and you know, he tried to say, as an example, well, I helped you guys with free public transportation. I had the opportunity to say, actually, Mark, Actually, <laughs> if you really want to know, we've been the one that's actually been pushing you, right? We've been the one that's calling for a cut in the police. And if it wasn't for that election, there would not be a whole conversation on the elected official side around defunding the police, right? Um, and so we're trying to figure out what to do next, right? And the one thing, the spoiler alert is, I am going to run again in 2023, right? Okay. Um, I am still... <laughs> I'm still going to be calling for the defund of the police. I'm still going to be calling for U.S. out of Venezuela, African nations, Bolivia, Iraq, Iran, Russia, and China, and so many other countries. And we need your help, so please come to our table after this panel and sign up. Thanks. We're gonna have to get behind that 2023. I'm gonna have to come to LA. We're gonna do something now. But thank you, Channing. I really appreciate that. Uh, and I really wanna commend you for raising so many of the points sharply. And I love that y'all have a theater. Uh, and that we had the panel earlier about cultural resistance. I hope people were able to see the panel. Everything is online on YouTube. I hope you go back and, and look at it. You know, I had the opportunity, I guess I told you I wasn't gonna editorialize, but I will, uh, to be. I was in Caracas a couple months ago, and we were in La Vega, and we had the opportunity to see an Afro-Venezuelan youth theater. And I, I don't, they're obviously not watching now, but I, I just want to commend those young folks. They put on the most amazing play for us that was, and it was like kids from like 6 to 14, and the theme of the play was slave women rising up and murdering their slave owner and liberating themselves. And, <laughs> And they were, so, they were so fantastic and so good and it was so deeply embedded in their own community and the, the power of, there was, there was a, an Afro-Venezuelan drum circle that was a part of it, of they were generally older people, some of their families, friends, whatever. And it was all sort of integrated in together and it had actually come from, it, it's hard to explain in a way, you almost had to be there to see it and to feel it. Uh, and I hope people do go to Venezuela and see it for themselves. But also we had the opportunity to go to a housing project, which is mainly Afro-Venezuelan people, where they're working in conjunction with the socialist government there to build their own housing and to create amazing community spaces, like not just places to live, but you know they had an area where they were feeding people in their own neighborhood who didn't have enough to eat. They were building cultural and sports spaces for people who were living in their neighborhood who had never had access to those kind of cultural sports activities. And this is all being done by the community, for the community. They're not charging people. They're continuing to struggle. And the sister who was the, the head of the elected head of this housing project is also a member of the National Assembly of Venezuela. And I just said, where is, 
I could never even imagine that in America. You know, somebody living in the projects, working for their people, somehow being in the national government, and this is allegedly a country that's undemocratic and shouldn't be here today. <laughs> um, but you know, you compare people like that to the so-called black representation. And I think it's important for people to know because Venezuela is, is, is not thought of as a country with many Afro-descended people. And that's part of why you have to see it for yourself to go there. But it is a very black country and the history of, 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 sla of slavery and the struggle to end slavery and of Pan-African culture is very, very, very deep there. And there were a number of African brothers and sisters who were with us on that trip. And it was powerful you know, to, see, to see us all interacting in, in that space. So I appreciate that y'all have a theater and that you're working on that level because I think the cultural resistance and you know, the ability to scale up and institutionalize and support our cultural workers who are fighting back is, is really a critical, critical point. So I want to turn here, absolutely not least, I don't even want to say last, but I don't even know how you ended up with the shortest bio either. Uh, you know, someone who I, I absolutely consider to be a mentor, frontline struggler, James Early, who, yeah, I mean, you all want to go ahead? Yeah, please, come here now. James is the former Smithsonian Institution Director of Cultural Heritage Policy and Assistant Secretary for Education and Public Service. He's a longtime Cuba, Caribbean, and Latin America solidarity activist, and he is currently the host of a fantastic new show from the People's Forum, New World Coming, which is a great political education interview series that deals with so many other pieces. He's also the reason I actually had the opportunity to meet Danny Glover one time, so I just want to stick that in there. But James Early, please, take it away. Thank you. This is a fundamentally important topic um, at this particular moment here in Los Angeles when the elites who represent neoliberal capitalism are meeting in the summit of the Americas and we about democracy, mostly from the Americas, need to deeply consider the significance of this topic, the role of Pan-Africanism in today's global struggles, particularly South-South. I want to share a few historical backdrops because we live the seeds of history. And Pan-Africanism starts here in the Americas. It does not start in Africa. It starts as a result of the expression of capitalism in colonialism, which sets forth the maturation of a global economic system in which the characteristic elements of the labor force were enslaved indigenous people and enslaved African people. Karl Marx talks about the significance of the super exploitation of these enslaved Africans, particularly here in the United States, and how it relieved some of the pressure on the exploitation of the English working class. That super exploitation of enslaved African labor rationalized by skin color, racialized capitalism, and an extraordinary superstructural or cultural dehumanization of Africans by some of the greatest religious figures of the time, by some of the greatest intellectual figures of the time, even some progressive individuals, that these indigenous people and that these Africans were not really human beings. Christianity was used to rationalize not only the subservience of these people to elites, but also to talk about them as chattels, as animals. The breeding of African women to produce new enslaved people. No matter what your status was in terms of your education, in terms of your class background, 
This was the motive force of bringing people across sectors together, be they people of African descent with income, or be they common laborers, such that Pan-Africanism then emerges first in a discourse in the most important region of the Americas, which continues today to be the signal region, not for the new world coming, but for the new world which has already arrived and is still maturing, which is socialist Cuba today. So how might we connect these dots? Henry Sylvester Williams, who was a Trinidadian in the 1870s, the African Association, in that first meeting, this is before the 1900 Pan-African Congress, talked about the exploitation of indigenous people. So this was not just a narrow, racialized, our ethnic perspective about African people, but it was the look at the whole of humanity. And all of your discussions, I've been listening to the panels before, talk about the racialized nature of the pandemic. You name the egregious circumstances of human beings today in this part of the world, and race and gender are the bottom line. So that the working class as the motive force of history must be considered in the context of the emergence of Pan-Africanism. And this notion of Africa uniting to confront Eurocentrism and to confront white supremacy at that time. Now, a lot of people inhabited the rubric of Pan-Africanism as a lot of people inhabit that rubric today because of the cross-class super exploitive nature of it based on skin color and the fact that they were free labor, they were enslaved labor. So that when the Pan-African conferences start, you have two camps. You've got the Monrovia camp, you've got the Casablanca camp. I won't go into detail on that. That's your homework to go and take a look at that. But a United States of Africa across all of these ethnic lines the second most diverse continent of humanity of languages. So there is no one African. There are many cultural expressions of Africans, many sociological expressions of Africa. But they were calling for the coming together. So we must look at Kwame Nkrumah. But we must also look at Ben Bella. We don't, we think about black Africa, but we must look at Ben Bella. We must also look at Gaddafi, who was not uh, Nkrumah or even Ben Bella, but he was the last major figure who not only called for the United States of Africa, he underwrote it. He said, I will underwrite an African military in order to exclude European invasions of this continent. That is part and parcel of his verdict. Now, we look at the Americas, particularly South America, the most unequal region of the world. We look at the results of colonialism. In Brazil, the official census self-identified. Over 100 million Brazilians identify as black and mixed race. Right. This is the official census. This is people self-identifying so that we have to look at the transversal nature of racism emanated from this emergence of a global capitalism and what are its implications today. We have to look at the Caribbean where Henry Sylvester Williams came from, the Haitian Revolution, the most organic revolution of marginalized and working people. which not until the emergence of Hugo Chavez Frias 
as a revolutionary leader on this continent, really came into force. Because he understood that Bolivar, Venezuela, the Gran Colombia region, the first country to defeat Spanish colonialism, Bolivar went where? He went to Haiti That's right. to ask for men and boats. And that is why Hugo Chavez, perhaps one of the most important organic intellectuals, not to mention his political organizational capacity, embraced the debt to Haiti and took on the question of Afro-descendants. In 2003, when the Trans-Africa Forum met with him in Caracas, he said, yo soy un mestizo, I am a mestizo of Indian and Spanish background, but my grandmother was una negra. Three months later in New York City, I don't know if it was Democracy Now! or National Public Radio, he says, you see these big lips? You see this curly hair? This is Mother Africa. I sat with Fidel Castro, with several of us at his home, four or five years before he died, and I asked him about the question of race, and his only response was, you should speak to Hugo. So this question of Pan-Africanism is not just a question of looking at Africa, it is first looking at the Americas from which it emanates. And then in 1945, when Pan-Africanism then takes full roots in the continent of Africa. And this is where uh, the question of major Af African socialism and these various streams come forth. Now, I wanna try to bring, uh, close, I wanna make a few comments because Pan-Africanism is often, a few citations here, Pan-Africanism is often expressed in individual personalities. Mm -hmm. And that is not an unimportant factor, but it is only the beginning factor. There's a debate of whether uh, Henry Sylvester Williams was the father of Pan-Africanism or whether W.E.B. Du Bois was the father of Pan-Africanism. They both made very significant contributions. But it is Du Bois that I want to concentrate on because he is the father of U.S. sociology. He produced, he was a scientific socialist eventually. He fought against the question of socialism. What is, what is socialism to the Negro? And he ended up joining the Communist Party at 90 years of age. So he, he grappled with these questions of race, and I want to go to his very famous quote because it's significant because most people truncate this quote. They right. cut it off that the color line was the major question of the 20th century. That was not the full quote. The problem of the, tw this is the quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia, and Africa to America and the islands of the sea. This is colonialism. He's looking at the racialized nature of colonialism. No, we should not forgive his commentary about men, but that is secondary to the moment. It is not, it is the, the question of women and the class struggle is fun, but let's take it in its historical time. Du Bois also said, most men in this world, read men and women, are colored. This is the global south. He's looking at colonialism. A belief in humanity means a belief in colored men are colored people. The future world will, in all reasonable probability, be what colored men are colored people make of it. This is his scientific analysis of the need for and the will of the global south of these colonialized people in Asia, India, Indonesia, the Caribbean, who will rise up against this capitalist system. Last quote. The emancipation of man, we human beings, is the emancipation of labor. And the emancipation of labor is the freeing of the basic majority of workers who are yellow, brown, and black. He's talking about all of us. Now, how does this come into view at this particular moment, on this particular day, 
in the realpolitik that we're facing in the struggle of the most unequal region of the world, Latin America, the greatest class divide, the most dynamic anti-capitalist movements at state levels of whether it's the, the pink tide or whether it's socialist Cuba or whether it's the socialist government of Venezuela and Nicaragua or whether it's Evo Morales, the first independent, the first indigenous president socialist. These, these, these are the real politic connections. So Hugo Chavez opened up new embassies on the continent of Africa. He sent Afro-descendants to be the chief representatives of the Bolivarian Revolution. These are not incidental factors. And he identified as an Afro-descendant, which did not dismiss his historical socialization as a mestizo. He could handle those multiple identities because he understood it. When we met with him, he turned to Danny Glover and he said, you should open up Trans-Africa Forums here in Venezuela. I realized then why I was there. And I said, Senor Presidente, usted tiene su foro de Transafrica, es la red afro-venezolana. You have your African forum here. He says, where is uh, Chucho? And he, Chucho Garcia, a very important Afro-descendant activist. These are the real politic questions. Now, let me close on these points. When I say real politic, we have a huge challenge. There is still a tendency of progressives and of socialists and of communists to speak in abstractions about labor and capital and the working class. The working class is the motive force of history. But the working class has a sociology. It's men. It's women. It's indigenous people. It's different languages. It's different body types. It's transgendered people, it's lesbians, it's gay people. This is the sociology. And if we miss that sociology, then we talk about an abstraction and we tend not to see the important democratic impulses of these racialized identities, of these gendered identities. We must examine why is it that we can go into the interior of Venezuela today are into Colombia, the most complex Afri African descendants who are being murdered daily, displaced from their land. Or we can, and children, young children, eight, nine, 10 years old, are singing the South African national anthem. Why is that? This is the reparatory justice part of the dehumanization, starting with colonialism, that we were animals, that we were less than human, that God intended us to be there. People are still trying to repair themselves. And so we must understand these Pan-African narratives of these young people who are learning this from their children and their poetry and their songs and be very careful that if they are not talking about class struggle, somehow that's unimportant. These things must be woven together. We must go back to the World Conference Against Racism 2001. How many of you have read the speech of Fidel Castro? Why is it, and I raise this with, for me, the most important revolutionary experience in my life, and that is Cuba. Why is it that we don't talk about that speech? I want to read to you the third paragraph of the extraordinary speech that Fidel Castro gave at the World Conference Against Racism in 2001. Cuba speaks of reparations and supports this idea as an unavoidable moral duty to the victims of racism based on a major precedent, that is the indemnification being paid to the descendants of the Hebrew people, which in the very heart of Europe suffered the brutal and loath loathsome racist holocaust. However, it is not with the intent to undertake an impossible search for the direct descendants of the specific countries of the victims of actions occurred throughout the centuries. The irrefutable truth is that tens of millions of Africans were captured, sold like a commodity and sent beyond the Atlantic to work in slavery while 70 million indigenous people in the hemisphere 
perished as a result of the European conquest and colonization. I want to add this last quote uh, to that one. No one has the right to boycott the conference as the United States did, which tries to bring some sort of a relief to the overwhelming majority of mankind afflicted by unbearable suffering and enormous injustice. Neither has anyone the right to set preconditions to this conference or urge it to avoid the discussion of historical responsibility, fair compensation, or the way we decide to rate the dreadful genocide perpetrated at this very moment against our Palestinian brothers by extreme right leaders in alliance with the hegemonic superpower. So this issue of Pan-Africanism is about all of our humanity because colonization of these indigenous people and these enslaved people was the pivot, the, 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 the foundational element of the emergence of this new global system called capitalism. So this is not just an independent question. Let me conclude on this point. In one of the things that Hugo Chavez did, one of the most important things he did, he was not just a towering individual courageous figure, he was an organizer. The community of Latin American and Caribbean nations, Petro Caribe, he turned this philosophy into organization. Yes. And so that the community of Latin American and Caribbean nations is now in direct opposition to the organization of American states, even as they are members of the organization of American states. And 90% or more of those countries are capitalists in their outlook, neoliberal in their practice. But the intra-capitalist rivalry where they are the super exploited Hugo Chavez had an understanding that we can find mutual benefit against a behemoth from the North, the super neoliberal capitalist in the These are the complexities that we have to deal with. So I am going to conclude on this one. I want to read the, 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 um, the paragraph of the 2000, uh, September 18, uh, 2021, the last major meeting, I think it was the last major meeting uh, under AMLO in, in Mexico uh, of their declaration. Item 30 reiterates that the transatlantic slave trade and the indigenous genocide in the region were heinous crimes against humanity. And acknowledging the efforts made to date in seeking to establish compensatory and reparatory effective resources and measures at the national, regional, and international levels, including the efforts of the CARICOM's Reparations Committee, that's where the center of gravity of now the global reparations movement is in Jamaica at the University of the West Indies, Sir Hilary Beckel, who represents all of the Caribbean elected leadership and is connected to the diverse elements from Rastafarians to lesbians to you name it and different nations of the Caribbean who support this. Now this is a politic then that we have to demand whether we are in socialist Cuba where there is a hugely important democratic debate in the context of Cuban socialism about the nexus of national and racial identity and racism in Cuba. Now don't look at James Early and say, well, why is he demeaning Cuba? I'm quoting, I spent, I sat with President Diaz Canales, who has established a commission, a presidential commission, against racism and discrimination. Because we were trained, many of us, that you can only eradicate, you cannot eradicate racism under capitalism, it can only be eradicated under socialism. Well, we now know that lived reality, notwithstanding the extraordinary accomplishments of the Cuban Revolution, that uplifted the most marginalized, dehumanized, exploited elements of the society, who are the black people, the, the uh, as Esteban Morales, the late Esteban Morales would say, the mestizos or the mulatos, including the Euro-Cubans who were members of, of marginalized communities in the working class. We have not confronted this. We still suffer with a Eurocentric view, a white blind spot, and the Cubans are the most refreshing state, not only in these Americas, 
despite the economic warfare and the attempt at regime change that's strangling them, they're facing their own internal country, uh, uh, issues. Raul Castro said when he became president, this embargo is killing us. But if you remove it tomorrow, it's not certain that this revolution would survive because of our own errors and failures. But he said that in the context of everything in advancing the revolution, not against the revolution. So that we have to take up these real politic questions and demand of our leaders, wherever they are, Lula is about to emerge again, in the largest African descended population outside of Nigeria. Yes. The largest African descended population on the planet outside of Nigeria lives in Brazil. So this is not about candomblé, uh, samba. Uh, this is, a, if we are not talking about black people in Brazil, then we are not serious. And there's a reason that I don't want to trust my fellow comrades who don't look at the race question as a transversal question. If we talk about the attack on gays and lesbians in Brazil and we are not talking about race, then I have to question that. So, you are the new world coming now. It's not coming mm. tomorrow. You are, you are part of a global dimension. I'm 75 years of age. I look at most of you and I think, what a dynamic, disciplined, organized, focused, non-sectarian mm. array of young, I underscore, adults who are taking the world in their hands and stepping into the public space. But in all of these revolutionary situations, you must address the issue of race. That is the significance of Pan-Africanism today. And this is the last time I'll say I'll conclude on this point. <laughs> <laughs> we must understand the significance of the Cubans, particularly the leadership of the late Fidel Castro, and of Hugo Chavez, the most profound internationalism of the Cuban Revolution was not in the rhetorical, analytical, dec declaratory level. It was sending hundreds of thousands of women and men, white, black, brown, Cubans, to South Africa, to Southern Africa, to complement and to help bring the liberation of South Africa. It is Hugo Chavez who then opens up a larger issue. It is Lula da Silva in Brazil who opened up communications with Africa and exchange of, of goods. This is the real politic that we have to embed this question of the significance of Pan-Africanism in the liberatory projects and particularly in South-South relations. Power to you, the new world. Give it up for James Early and please one more round of applause for our entire panel. Very, very well deserved. Very, very well deserved. We're gonna get ready to move into. Power to the people. All right. I'm glad to know y'all not sleeping here. Okay. No, but thank you again to, to all of our panelists, and we're gonna be moving into another plenary. And I just want to take one quick point of personal privilege here because. I, I do have to say that, you know, we always add a, a whole range of countries and a litany of countries that we want to show solidarity with and struggles. And I have to add one, and that's Swaziland. Uh, that's another one that you're not hearing about right now. But, you know, this is the last absolute monarchy on the African continent. Young activists are fighting very hard. They're being kidnapped. They're being tortured. They're being murdered on a daily basis. But I have to say, you know, the student movement and the trade union movement have been shutting that country down. The so-called King Maswati III has turned Swaziland into a warren of exploitation 
for Taiwanese companies that are exploiting Africa and selling clothes here in the United States, and they are fighting very hard. They're asking for solidarity from people around the world. So I hope people can start to look up groups like the Swazi National Union of Students and start to support them and start to raise them up in the same way because they really, really, really are doing everything they possibly can to defeat a very powerful enemy that U.S. imperialism, especially in the guise of Coca-Cola, is doing quite a bit to support. So I, I just had to say that, that the people of Swaziland are struggling and we have to support them. So we, we do have a vendor table as well for no more. So I want to mention that. I appreciate Friday, that. Friday, 11 to 3, if you guys Friday, are around tomorrow, to we have these shirts and sweatshirts. There's going to be a plenary in here like as soon as I get off the stage. So absolutely don't go anywhere. And I just want to shout out People's Project and... Uh, Finica Bonita, who donated free produce for food distribution behind the food trucks today. So shout out to them as well for the free food. Stay here for the plenary. Stay for the concert that's going to be later. My, my dear comrade, Lingua Franca, is going to be performing among many others. You won't want to miss it. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to my panelists. And hopefully we'll be able to commune here in the rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.